Welcome to the Hinckley Institute of Politics. My name is Kendall and I will be your host for today's Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics was established in 1965 through the generous bequest of the Noble Foundation and Robert H. Hinckley. The Institute is dedicated to teaching students respect for practical politics and the principle of citizen involvement in government. The Hinckley Institute offers paid internships to students of all majors here locally in Washington, D.C. and in 55 countries around the globe. The Hinckley Institute also offers classes, nation's only campaign management minor, week-long experiences to Washington, D.C., and over $70,000 in academic scholarships. We invite you all to go next door or visit our website, www.hinckley.utah.edu, for more info. With the Hinckley Institute's upcoming 50th anniversary, we decided to honor the University of Utah's most outstanding professors. The Hinckley Institute relies on exceptional professors to prepare our students for our transformative internship and mentorship opportunities. In line with the series, we will recognize five outstanding professors each semester from a wide range of disciplines. Today's outstanding professor is Kristen Hawkes, a distinguished professor of anthropology at the University of Utah. Her principal research interests are the evolutionary e ecology of hunter-gatherers and human evolution. She studies age and sex differences in foraging strategies among hunter-gatherers and uses comparative observations of non-human primates as well as evolutionary modeling to develop and test hypotheses about the evolution of human life histories and social behavior. She is a member of the Scientific Executive Committee of the Leakey Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. It is our honor to have her. Please join me in welcoming our guest. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you. Thank you. So good. I'm loud. You can hear me in the back. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Thank you. Great to Hello. see you guys. I was wondering, you know, who, who would be here in the audience? I was wondering whether it's mostly going to be people from political science, but I see metallurgy and chemistry. Fantastic. And even anthropology. That's great. Um, so I'm glad to see you all here. And this is going to be interesting. I'm going to try, in this narrow amount of time we have together, to get you on the same page with me in thinking about what happened in the evolution of our lineage. Now, for those of you that are political scientists, you probably don't think about human evolution very often. Uh, but I, I'm guessing that when you talk about whatever you talk about in political science, if it's a particular problem of the moment, that, that one of the things that you do is um, you want to know how we got into this pickle, right? Uh, to, to begin to try to understand the pickle and maybe, maybe what, what we should expect to happen next. Well, there's an argument that um, understanding how we got into this pickle, us, uh, looking much deeper in uh, the evolutionary story can really help us understand both ourselves and um, lots of things that are happening around us in human behavior all the time. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I am going to start with pointing out, I mean, some of you maybe think about this sometimes, but I bet some of you don't, that here's, here's the phylogenetic story of the moment, right? So our, we belong to the family of hominids. That's now the label for the family that includes the, the, the living great apes and us. We all belong to the same family of hominids. And, and we know, I mean, Darwin guessed that, but, but now we've got all these other lines of evidence that really confirm this is the case. And one of the most amazing things about recognizing that is that some of them are more closely related to us than to each other. So if you look at the world out of a chimpanzee's eyes, their closest, or genus Pan, because their sister species, bonobos, are the closer. But those, those two living species of genus Pan are more closely related to us than they are to the, to, to the gorillas. So yet, you know, if we look at them and, and then we look at us, it looks like there is just this enormous divide and we're so different from them. So how do we even start to think about 
how that came to be, how come? And, and we could probably spend all the time I'm allowed here in, in you know, I'd ask you to nominate your favorite feature <laughs> that distinguishes us, right? We could get quite a list. And, and probably, if I did that, the first thing you'd have on that list would not be our distinctive longevity. And um, I'm going to try to make the case that a really important set of hypotheses that we need to have on the table when we're trying to explain our evolution actually pay attention to that as a crucial feature. Our longevity is greater than that of any of the other great apes, and it has some very special characteristics that have important consequences for a bunch of things about us. So it's not only that you wouldn't think longevity first, but also here, this, this figure is reprinted all the time. Uh, uh, there's just a sample of them. And in fact, that ends in 2000. But people are making this point all the time. I, I hear it in the news almost every week. Somebody pointing out that life expectancy is so much greater now than it was not very long ago. And what gets associated with recognizing that is the idea that old people are actually a recent feature of the globe, right? That people like me were not around in the old days. Well, life expectancy is really astonishingly long now. In fact, if you're a little girl born in Utah in the last week, your life expectancy is 82 or 83 years, which is really something. Um, but, and, and, and we also know that the age of menopause so, so here is a postmenopausal woman. I'm still able to more or less, you know, add two and two, carry on a bunch of things, but my fertility is over. And people uh, draw figures like this to say, well, look, the end of female fertility is uh, more or less fixed, and yet now life expectancy is so much greater. It must be that we actually were designed to die before the age of menopause. And it's something about recent scientific medicine and public health and something about recent human history that accounts for why there are so many old people. Well, the, the statistic isn't wrong, but what life expectancy means is really easy to misunderstand. So, if we look at Sweden in 1840, where we have really good census data, so we can actually do this, and 1840 is back here. Uh, now, I've, I've drawn a picture here that comes from an actual Swedish census, and I'm just looking at the female half of the Swedish population, but showing you its age structure. So um, follow me here on what this represents, because I'm going to use figures like this. Each one of these bars is a five-year age class. And the length of the bar is the percentage of the population in that age class. And the, the, the orange bars are the, the girls. They haven't reached maturity yet. The green bars are the women in their childbearing years. And then those golden bars at the top are the women who are past their fertility. Now, in this population, life expectancy is only 44 years. But if we just look at the adults, more than a third of the women are past their childbearing years. And if we were to start at adulthood, if a girl's lucky enough to live through childhood, her chances of living past her fertility are way by far what's likely to happen. So the reason life expectancy is so short is because there are all these folks with very short lifespans who die as infants and children that go into the average. It's that that pulls it down. And in populations like ours, where fertility is so low, infant mortality is so low, the consequence is that the average really goes up. That's what it looked like in Sweden in the middle of the 19th century. Now, Sweden, in the middle of the 19th century, was an agricultural population, right? Um, 
agriculture has been a big deal on the globe for the last not quite 10,000 years, begins about 10,000 years ago, but actually we don't have agriculture in a lot of places in the world until even more recently. That's in terms of what we know about our, our lineage in evolutionary time, that's just yesterday. But if we compare this to what we can see in a few places in the world where we have this really interesting experimental opportunity where there are people who are not depending on domesticates, they're living on wild food, uh, and we look at what happens to the mortality experience in those populations, what we see is they look very much like what we see with the Swedish case. So these are three different hunter-gatherer populations where we have really good demography. And as you can see across the top, life expectancy is way less than 40 in all of them. And yet, in every single one of them, if we just look at the adults, about a th and we're just looking at the women again, right? So our, what these are showing, is, that, is it clear what these? Yeah, so we're just looking at the women. But um, about a third of the adult women are past their fertile years. And so if we compare using, now I've picked one of these. I picked the, the although they're, they're different in interesting ways, all of which we could talk about. I picked this one, the Hadza, to sort of represent us, because I'm going to talk especially about that particular case. So here we are. This is what the age structure looks like for these hunter-gatherers. And these are all actually models based on life tables. Um, and, and we have the same thing for chimpanzees in the wild. This is what the age structure of chimpanzees in the wild looks like. And it's different. There aren't very many females who are past their fertile years. And in fact, adulthood starts earlier if you're a chimpanzee than if you're a human. But we know some other stuff about how life works for the other great apes and how it works for humans that fills in uh, the, the foundation we need to understand why that age structure thing is telling us important stuff. And this Hadza case that I mentioned is the one I'm going to privilege here. Uh, so my collaborators, Jim O'Connell in this, in, at, at, in anthropology at the University of Utah, and Nick Blurton Jones at UCLA, we uh, spend some time living with Hadza folks who are living by hunting and gathering, trying to figure out how you, how you actually do that. You know, systematically, people let us hang out, uh, looking at how people spent their time, what they got for it, what you do if you're, depending on what your age and sex is, how it pays off. And we were so surprised. I'm not going to have time to tell you the details of why we started this project in the first place. We weren't really especially interested in old ladies. And yet, what we found, because we were collecting these systematic data to our astonishment, was that these old women, so these two ladies are in their middle 60s when this photograph is taken, the time they spend and what they get for it, digging these deeply buried tubers, played such an important role in what there was for dinner in the evening. And we found that little kids were amazingly uh, active, uh, really energetic foragers. But for certain kinds of resources, like those, they're just too little to be able to be very effective at, at acquiring them. And because that resource is really the key carbohydrate staple for these folks year, all year round, if you're a little kid and you can't do it, well, you got to depend on somebody else. They depend on their mothers. But then when mom has a new baby, that correlation went away in our data set. We could see that. The women who were spending more time at it, working harder, their kids were growing better until they had a new baby. And then the correlation was with how hard grandmother was working. And if we were looking at chimpanzees, or gorillas, or bonobos, or orangutans, any of the other great apes, what we'd see is that the relationships between moms and their kids, the social relationships, continue throughout a lot of life, but 
when moms have a baby, then like all mammals, we all do this. They depend on mom, so they're depending on her milk. But in the other apes, when that kid is weaned, it feeds itself. And although the social relationship is important, mom now can move on and have that next baby. Uh, but the previous one is getting its own lunch. And yet, in the human case, using the Hadza again, but we don't have to stick to the Hadza case, uh, a woman can move on and have that next baby because somebody else is covering the action of her kids. And in this, this, this woman in the lower right-hand corner here who has that baby, you can just see the baby's head, her mother is the one who's working up her digging stick, and these kids are going to depend on their grandmother. Uh, that's going to be key to how well they do. And so we've got this picture of the way in which kids grow up that's really different in chimpanzees than it is in humans. And the age structure is kind of associated with that. In the, in the chimpanzee case, what happens is most females die in their cycling years. They get to be really old ladies. But in the case of humans, that's not so. That it's rare, more frequent than in our society, but it's relatively rare for a woman to die in her cycling years. She remains healthy. She remains productive. She lives beyond those years. And so we've got that fraction of the population that's actually subsidizing the fertility of the younger women. And so thinking about how do we how do these pieces of life history go together? We had the great good fortune, I had the great good fortune, of having just across the road from me um, a, a theoretical biologist who influenced me in so many ways um, in, in how I think about evolution. And Rick Charnov, who was here at this university, he, he left long ago, I'm sorry to say, but, but he was here then, and he was trying to understand what runs the variation in life history across living things? You know, if we look at, you know, you've, any of you who have domesticated pets, you know, you may have a dog, maybe you got a dog when you were a little kid, and that dog got to be old maybe even before you grew up. Dogs have, uh, they age faster, they have shorter lifespans. This kind of variation is huge across the living world. <laughs> And the order we belong to, the primates, is no exception. We see that variation across the primates. Some have relatively fast lives. They grow up quickly. They don't live very long. They die young. And for some, the life histories are much slower. And Charna was trying to understand why does that variation take the shape it does. He built some models to explain it. And in his models, the key explanatory variable was adult mortality. If adult mortality is high, so the chances you're going to die are pretty high, then you better get on with having your kids now, or the chances are you'll die before you make any contribution to uh, future gene pools. This is a figure from his 93 book in which he's showing this, what I just said, average adult lifespan, which is a measure of how long you're likely to live as an adult, and its correlation with how long you wait before you start having kids. And so here's the figure in his book, and there are the great apes. They are by far the longest lived of all the primates, of the non-human primates, but there are humans right up there. Now, he didn't say anything about that in the book, but I already told you enough that if you knew more about his model, you'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The way this model works is females are spending their adult lifespans having babies. But in the human case, they stop. So yet, it is the case that humans are just where they ought to be in terms of the relationship in his model. And we already had data pointing out to us that important role that grandmothers may be playing in the number of descendants they're going to have because they subsidize the fertility of their daughters. And that was the basis for a hypothesis about what might be key to the special characteristics of our longevity, a grandmother hypothesis. The relationship between those 
variables is actually one that's very, stays very close to the same across the primates. And, and that's the case if we just look at the hominids. It stays very close to the same. Uh, so, so humans seem like they fit Charnov's model, except that another one of his predicted invariants was the relationship between how long it takes you to start having babies and then how fast you have them. And humans do it way faster. But grandmothering explains that. We have shorter intervals between births than the other apes do because somebody helps. And so as we put those pieces together, the exciting thing was we thought we could explain a lot of features of our life history. Wow, that could account for why when the genus we belong to appears for the first time in the paleoanthropological record, it all of a sudden gets into all these places where it had never been. Well, a different way of dealing with resources could mean you're released from being tethered by how little kids can feed themselves because somebody's helping them. And some features of the earliest archaeology. Really, we, we thought this is using the kinds of things that Charnam had built a model about. It looked like we had a hypothesis we'd really want to have on the table about explaining our evolution. Um, but, you know, could grandmother really do that? That's putting a lot of weight maybe on ah, mm, this, this thing. Um, and so uh, we were tooting our horns, you know, and saying, wow, this, this really looks important. But uh, a lot of people saying, well, a lot of other things going on. Don't know if I'm sh sure I don't believe that. And we don't have a time machine, right? We can't go back. We do have some fossils. They're silent on so many things. We do have the genetic record. It can tell us. It's telling us more and more all the time. But this is why sometimes we just have to be reduced to depending on models. And uh, although it's a verbal model I was just telling you about, being able to actually build a model and see whether that story actually happens, as they say, in silico. You know, if we, if we lay out these features in a computer and run things in evolutionary time, what will happen? So I was so lucky to have this mathematical biologist, Peter Kim, get interested in the problem. And uh, Peter built a model. This is Peter's little graphic showing what his agent-based model will do. It's assuming the kinds of regularities that, that, that Charnov has modeled. It assumes those things. And um, then we run this model, starting out having a, a, a life history that is like the other great apes, and in fact, seeing then what happens if we add helpful grandmothering. And there's, there's the math. We won't talk about that. But if we just look at the trade-offs for females with, with the assumptions in this model, at the ape-like equilibrium, average adult lifespan is mm, something like 17 or 18 years. When we add grandmothering, the and there are costs and benefits in here. We can talk about all this if, if you want, if, we, if, that, if that turns out to be useful. But when we add grandmothering, we get a different equilibrium with a, a life history that's about twice as long. But now, if we run the simulations, here is a piece of the story that's so initially surprising. Now, this is a two-sex model. We had the red and the blue Russian dolls. Some are boys and some are girls. And when we add the boys into the story, average adult lifespan is pushed by the males to be higher than what is optimal for the females. And in fact, the males push it so hard that although this is about where it stays, right about 20 years, sometimes they actually push it so high that the populations go extinct. That persists, and then if we take one of these and start there and then add helpful grandmothering, what happens is the equilibrium changes. And we move now to a, a pattern that is very human-like. So this is time. Maybe I need to be slower here and explain what's actually going on. 
we're looking at average adult lifespan here. <laughs> and, and as long as we don't have grandmothering in the story, we stay at this ape-like equilibrium. Then we add just that one thing. And what happens is, first of all, they have to escape the basin of attraction of the ape-like equilibrium. But then, when they do, they march ever upward to a new equilibrium. We see two of them. And they don't all make it in this set of simulations. But the ones that start to move all move. And the place they go is, again, a place where, because we've now added males, when, when grandmothering is in there, even greater average adult lifespan is advantageous through the males. So they push it beyond what's actually optimal for the females. So that's just modeling something that we, I started out by describing. We already know this. If we look at the other apes, in every single case, the patterns of mothering are this independent thing. Mom has a baby. She takes care of the baby. It depends on her for food until it's weaned. Then that kid is independent, gets its own lunch. But mom is the only one who's doing it. And then she has the next one. So she and the kid are the, the unit. And then that repeats itself as she has the next one. Um, but that's not the way it is in our species. Wherever we look, whether we're talking about the, the Hadza or other foragers, whether we're talking about other traditional societies that depend on domesticates, wherever we look, human mothers are not independent mothers. Well, any of you who are single mothers trying to do it alone can say, oh boy, how do I know that, right? Uh, human mothers depend on help, have depended on help. And a consequence of the fact that mothers have help is that then, before this little one is you know, much more than a toddler, you can move on and have the next one. Now, that, that's a, up in the left-hand corner there is, is, is an Ache mother. So this is one of the foraging cases that I talked about in the beginning. She's about to give birth, so she's very pregnant. On the day that photograph was taken, in fact, she gave birth. And there's her daughter, who's not even three, right? And so there's going to be another kid. Well, this is something she can do, and the kid will thrive and survive because she has help. Now, that has important consequences. And it's Sarah Hurdy who has tried to lay this out in just delicious detail. And for those of you that haven't read any of her books, I just can't recommend anything more highly. She's, she's dealt with a lot of these issues. Very unusual for a person who tries to do that because she'll take you to the primary literature. She's, she's very careful about what we actually know about a lot of things. And this is the label she used, ambivalent mothering for one of the consequences of this tendency to move on and have that next kid before the previous one is independent. It means now, actually, I have more than one dependent at a time. I have to be worrying about where the help is coming from. I have all these trade-offs, which are trade-offs other eight mothers never have to make. And so selection is going to favor capacities to do that in the way that end up leaving the most descendants. But the thing I want to underline here is the consequence that has for infants. So this is really a different deal if you're a human infant than if you're an infant in, in any of these other ape species. If you are uh, a chimpanzee kid, you're born, and that's all your mother's. She, you are the apple of her eye, the center of her world. That's the only thing she has to worry about. You don't have to do anything. You're just there. And she's going to do her best to see that you make it to be weaned. But in the human case, you come in, and mom's got a bunch of other stuff to worry about. She's got other kids to worry about. She's got where's the help coming from to worry about. In fact, in a lot of cases, here you are. You've barely come out of the box, and you're not even on mom. Somebody else is you know, cooing and uh, cuddling you and enjoying you and finding you cuter than an Xbox. But you do not have automatic 
attention from your mom. And as Hurdy points out, that places selection pressures on infants that are entirely novel. That now the infants who are better at engaging their mothers, engaging other potential caretakers, in get, figuring out with what they intend for the moment, in letting their other potential caretakers and their mothers note what they intend for the moment, getting at each other, getting into each other's heads, this kind of thing that I'm uh, trying to do with you, get you to, to be on the same page with me, this now gets to be something that, that selection favors in an entirely different way for us than it can for any other primate or any other animal. And Michael Tomasello, who's a developmental psychologist who's been really interested in what are the differences in social cognition between humans and the other apes. I mean, he started out especially interested in humans, but early in his career, he got really interested in trying to identify what was different. And he and his collaborators have, through a whole series of experiments and drawing on the work of many others, characterized this thing that seems to separate us from the other primates as what he calls shared intentionality. We have this appetite to be on the same page, are you with me, <laughs> do you? And for us, this is really crucial, really important. We can see this in, in little kids. We see this in uh, experiments that Tomasello and his collaborators, so Esther Herman was in Tomasello's group, this paper published a few years ago, showing the results of their experiments with little kids and other apes showing that, man, our cousins, our evolutionary cousins, the other apes, are really smart when it comes to a lot of things about the physical world. And we can't really tell the difference between these little kids and the other apes and how they, um, particular kinds of experiments, how they perform. But when we're talking about things that involve social cues, the differences are enormous, that, that, that human uh, infants are behaving differently. There's a lot to say about this that I don't have time to talk about, so I'll pass right on. But if you wanted to go see some of the cool experiments that have come out of Tomasello's group, Felix Warnikin, who's now at Harvard, has a website where he's showing some of these. They're really cool. Um, but, and and lots, of, lots of complaints sometimes about those experiments. But the bottom line, which lots of other developmental psychologists agree about, is that a thing about humans, about babies, is very early on, they are so socially engaged. And so we have people at lots of different places. Sometimes these developmental psychologists, aren't they're not really interested in the evolutionary questions. They're just interested in how does it happen? A baby you know, who doesn't know anything, how do they get in to, to the social world? How do they come to? Um, deal with not only the natural world, but the social world that they have to be a part of. But what comes out of their observations and experiments is the evidence that very early human babies are so attentive to discriminating individuals as potentially dangerous or potentially friendly and um, responding to their uh, um, social possibilities and trying to engage them uh, even though the tendency is to say human babies are, quote, secondarily altricial. And so this altricial precocial distinction, which actually started out by talking about uh, other animals, birds in particular, how whether or not right out of the egg they can do a lot of stuff or whether they're just blobs. The tendency is to talk about human babies as blob-like. You know, there's that baby, and it kind of can't do anything at all. It's really helpless. Well, our babies are helpless. So are the babies of other apes who are very helpless right after birth. But socially, very precocious. So there's a package of things here that um, go together, that characterize us. And I've just put some hypotheses on the table about the connection between the way in which our life history evolved to have this odd characteristic 
So here is mom and a baby, and I've just added a couple of other key figures. This is that kid's grandmother, and this is her older sister. And I've just put on the table the argument that grandmothering, there are lots of earmarks of our longevity that it suggests grandmothering was crucial. That that altered the trade-offs for moms, because now they're we're almost more like litter bearers than having singletons. We got more than one at a time. And that has consequences for the kind of social sensitivity, social uh, cluiness that that selection is going to favor. And the shared intentionality is a way to capture that. But I want to talk about another major set of consequences of having this particular life history. Another actor, I've talked about males when I said that in, in the two sex simulations, uh, males are having a big effect on where the population ends up, but I sort of left that alone. Now, here is the baby's father, and you know, here's a picture that there he is. These are hods of folks, and they hunt and gather for a living, and there he is equipped with his tools. Um, and so now I want to add the boys to the age structure that, that I just talked about. So before I was just looking at the female side, right? So this is the Hadza again to represent humans. And this is uh, wild chimpanzees uh, to represent the other great apes. And something that's very likely the ancestral condition. Well, I just had the female side before. Now I've added, again, from life tables, from actual data, the, the males. So uh, you can see that there are differences. But if I kind of smush them together now, so the differences maybe become clearer. And female fertility is ending at essentially the same age in all the living hominids, us and the other great apes. And so those brackets are showing the individuals who are in the fertile years. And because this increased longevity on the female side, we've got a bunch of postmenopausal females. Well, on the male side, male reproductive physiology works in a different way. We've got a whole bunch of old guys now who are in competition with the young guys. Um, and what's happened is things have gone from a female biased sex ratio in the fertile ages in chimpanzees, which is typical of mammals, to a very male biased age structure in the fertile ages. So there's that figure up here. And if we actually look at that in these simulations, we look at what happens to the adult sex ratio, as it's called. That's where we're looking at the sex ratio in the fertile ages. Well, when we're at the ape-like equilibrium, this is males to females, uh, it's, it's most of the time below one. It's female biased, which is what, what it's like in most mammals. And then we take one of those, we add grandmothering, things change. The, the gray things are showing what's happening in each one of these simulations. But there you can see we go from a female biased age structure to one that's male biased. You might say, well, you know, so what? What does that really mean? But what we know from looking at lots of other animals is the more male biased the sex ratio is, the more males guard mates. And it's easy to see the economics of that, right? If there are a lot of guys out there competing, then when you got one, man, you may do better to try to hang on to her than keep moving on to another one. So the adult sex ratio turns out to be really crucial in whether or not mate guarding pays off. And in fact, even though we know in humans, I, or I have just asserted in humans, that to be human is to have a male biased sex ratio in the fertile ages, what, we, what, what lots of investigators have noted is how male biased it is has an important effect on how stable pair bonds are. 
So a thing we do, we make those pair bonds. It's really different from, from chimpanzees. They don't do that. And our pair bonds are, you know, sometimes they're not very long, a month or two. Sometimes they're lifelong. And all kinds of things in between. Um, we make them all the time. But how male bias the sex ratio is, uh, is correlated with how stable they tend to be. And when we look at other primates that have what's called modular social organization, so that means that there are these units within the community. So this little figure is meant to show that. You can identify these families that are very cohesive. Uh, we, we've got uh, the, the adult pair identified uh, within this larger community. That's what we do, too. Uh, and so this modular or hierarchical social organization is sometimes called. Whenever we look at examples like that, the claims that a male makes on a female, I'm hanging on to her, whether or not he can make them in the first place, whether or not he can hang on to her and keep it, depends on whether the other guys will let him. Uh, I would say a lot about Hamadryas baboons, because they're a wonderful illustration about this, and we, we know lots of, uh, we don't know quite a bit about, the, about this particular species. But this thing about the role of relationships with other males is something anthropologists have long noted in human societies. So anthropologists have paid attention to this for a long time, not from the perspective I've been laying it out, but emphasizing how important male alliances are in all kinds of social organizations. And so while I'm constructing a story about a beast, us, in which shared intentionality is a really a crucial thing to how our social lives work. These are little kids. It's really life and death for them. But they're going to grow up. The, the little boys and girls are going to grow up to be uh, adult men and women. And they're going to form pair bonds. And we've actually told stories about the evolution of our uh, species, perhaps our genus, as one where this pair bond thing in which dads are supporting moms and infants, that's the key to our evolution. Well, I've laid out some reasons to think we left out some key actors. Grandmother is really important. And left out these guys. How important these other guys are to whether or not he can make the claim on her in the first place and then hang on to it. Um, and so anthropologists like Jane Collier, a cultural anthropologist who's not really sure biology is relevant to anything, nevertheless, when she's describing what we know from the ethnographic record about marriage in traditional societies, generalizes this way. Relations between spouses are best understood in the context of relations between men. Men must assert claims to women in competition with other men. Actually, if you said that to a biologist who worked on other organisms, I wouldn't be surprised. But uh, the, the ethnographic evidence consistent with this is really clear. And so when, when these Hadza guys go to work every day, you know, they're going off to hunt, he could go out there and hunt for small animals. He could actually dig tubers. Men are bigger and stronger than women. He could actually dig them at a faster rate than women do. He could do those things. And if he did, he'd be bringing home stuff to his wife and kids, stuff that would go on the dinner table, make sure they get fed every day, which is, which is the usual story we tell about human evolution. But these Hadza guys don't do that. And they actually do something that we see among hunter-gatherers everywhere. Instead, they go for the big hits, the big animals. Now, these guys are, they didn't, as a group, kill this giraffe. They're just taking advantage of the photo op now that they've <laughs> found the carcass. Um, but this is what they focus on, the big animals. And because they're focused on the big ones, 
they end up getting nothing 30 days out of every month. Because getting those big ones is a very rare success. But when you get a big one, it's a very big deal. Everybody knows about it. Everybody comes to the carcass. Men, women, children, they all come to the carcass. They all eat at the carcass. They all carry it away. They all come to eat the people's meat. Now, they all know who it was that killed the animal, but his wife, and kids don't get any more than anybody else. If they went for the small animals instead, we've done experiments to show that their success rates would be higher. They could hang on to more of it. Most of it wouldn't go to everybody else, because those small animals, there isn't very much anyway. Most of it would go to their own household. But instead, because what the other guys think of them is so important, they are drawn into something that makes a big public splash. So there's this tension between you know, the relationship at home and this other stuff that's really important, something that anthropologists have talked about across many ethnographies. The consequence of the fact that they do that is there's way more for everybody. If they had chosen, to go for the small things, they bring more to their own household, uh, but it wouldn't make much of a splash. Because they go for the big ones, the result of everybody doing that is there's way more meat for everyone to eat. So I've tried in a short space of time to ask you guys to put together a lot of things. Um, a lot of things that are hypotheses that come from different lines of evidence about what happened in the evolution of our lineage that has shaped what we're like in so many ways, that shaped the way we deal with problems now. And here's this set of arguments that it looks like understanding the role that ancestral grandmothers played maybe the key to understanding this weird life history in which we have this striking postmenopausal longevity. We mature really late, but we have really short birth intervals. We wean our kids earlier than the other grade eights do. That had consequences for selection on moms. It, it altered the kinds of trade-offs that moms have to be good at solving. And that meant really important challenges for infants, where if you're an infant, this is less true in societies like ours, infant mortality is extremely low, but in these hunter-gatherer cases, that's where mortality is the highest. Making it through those first, that first year is really crucial. And so that's where selection is especially strong. And this shared intentionality thing seems to be a thing that's linked to the capacity of little kids to just captivate us. That's, that child, is you can't walk behind somebody who has a baby in a backpack that's looking out the back and grinning at you without just wanting to go, oh, isn't that cute? They've, they've really got our number, right? <laughs> but one of the other consequences is this notable bias in the sex ratio in the mating ages. And as in other animals, that strong male bias looks like it can account for why pair bonds are characteristic of humans. As I said, chimpanzees don't do that. But for humans everywhere, this pair bonding thing is something that goes on. And being able to make these claims for males depends on whether the other guys will let them get away with it. Now, because of this shared intentionality, we can actually be engaged in all kinds of things. So there are all kinds of ways that men can compete with each other. Lots of different venues for male competition. It isn't just you know, who can beat the other guy up first. We can, men can compete about you know, who can, I don't know, I was going to say piss the highest on the wall, but I don't want to say that. Almost anything, right? 
Um, but, and that has many sides, including some very positive ones, including a consequence for the supply of public goods that mean there's more for all of us. So, a lot of stuff on the table. I'm eager to see what you, what you think. All right, so just raise your hand. You guys, most of you know the drill. Um, just speak into the mic and ask your question. Corey Boren, um, how does male mate choice, uh, societies that have strong ma the males choosing the mates versus females choosing the mates uh, play into this? Because if the female chooses the male who brings home a quail every day versus a giraffe once a month, that'll have a factor, right? Yeah, I, I, so really an interesting and important question that taps into what, what has been very much in the literature. Uh, in which often the emphasis is on mating depending a great deal on female choice, and especially maybe in our lineage, that somehow uh, it, often it's the case that the males control the stuff that, that females need to um, make their own way and feed their kids, and therefore there are lots of reasons why it's in a female's interest to see if she can edge things so she links up with a guy who can, is more likely to do that better. And lots of arguments about female choice playing a very strong role. The argument that is on the table here is that it's competition among the males that's really determining which guys have the stuff, who which of them have more of it, and consequences then for choices that, that females make are the table is set by what the boys are doing. I, one of the first models that I built trying to address this question, a little sort of game theory model in which I made the assumption that if a woman were making a choice, she'd really like to have a guy who would, as you say, bring home a quail to her. She'd like to have a guy who is a provisioner for herself, but she'd really rather the other guys all did something that she got something from, you know, that provided for the community. So we've got this interesting, complicated set of conflicts of interest. My suggestion would be that the extreme emphasis on female choice as, as the main organizing part of how mating works in human societies is, is not very consistent with what we know about ethnography and in which the, the tendency for men to be running so much of the show is, is sort of evident across cultures, not only among hunter-gatherers, but among um, uh, uh, societies that are, depend on agriculture. And then I would say, when we talk about the experiments we're running right now, which are really interesting, you know, we're, we're part of this giant experiment. What is going on with our social organization? We live in sort of isolated nuclear families in ways that are really weird, given human experience. That most of what's happened in, in not only is it true among hunter-gatherers, but in agricultural societies, uh, nuclear families are not by themselves with the door closed, that actually people are interacting with all kinds of others all the time. Kids have intimate relationships with lots of other adults. It's not the way we are running things in a lot of our neighborhoods where you don't even want the kids to go outside and play. You're worried something will happen to them. And this kind of separation is odd. Where it's all going to go, it's hard to say. You know, predicting the future. Evolutionists like to predict the past, right? <laughs> where we can actually run some tests. So a long answer to what is really a good question. That if, if we really thought the world were such that women were making the choices, I think it would be really different than the one we live in. It is the case that women are having the babies, men are not, men are bigger than women. There are all kinds of basic things about the differences between the sexes which come out of our primate heritage and persist today. And whether or not we're going to have test tube babies and uh, jobs all being the same for males and females and some of those sex differences beginning to really disappear. I don't know, probably not in my lifetime would be my guess.
Sorry for such a long answer. Oh, yes. My name is Jessica Talbot, and I had a question about the grandmothering model. Yeah. Is it possible to extrapolate that theory onto socioeconomic areas in the United States, perhaps, where there are more nuclear families? Is it possible that extra support is why certain demographics have better health overall than others? Um, it's really such an interesting question. What about grandmothering in this world we live in where we have these, where we, we do this Neolithic residence thing, you know, where people move away, you're not necessarily living near grandmother, right? And, and we have these kind of isolated families. Um, that's, again, that's different from what's been most of human experience. And yet, people detect grandmother effects even in our socioecology, so that ties between women and their mothers, somebody did a cell phone use thing in Europe, looking to see who was actually calling who the most. And um, especially when there were little kids, you know, this turned out to be such an important link. I know the joke about, um, it says on my bumper sticker, spending my grandchildren's inheritance, right? So old people, all go off and they don't worry about um, the, the family. But those are exceptional. You know, it does look like these ties really matter. And uh, I don't know, you can all think about your own, either your own uh, parents or your own kids and whether or not in your own life those links have, have been important. I think in most cases they still end up being important. We know from ethnography that if you look at traditional societies in which People, when they marry, they continue to live with kin until there are wage labor opportunities. And that's when we see what anthropologists call Neolithic residence, really increasing in frequency. So people, you know, the thing about having family around is it's cool because you can count on them, but the other side is they got their hooks into you, right? And so being able to get away, can't we just be alone? And so Neolithic residence is the thing that increases in frequency. We do try to do that. I mean, it's like this living alone thing, which is now way more common in the American population. Individuals, actually single individual households are increasing in frequency. So we do try to do that, but we've also got all these other ways of being in contact with each other, right? So. Uh, and, and we think maybe we have more control over that. If I do it by texting or cell phone, then I kind of get have, feel like I control it more. What that swirl of changes is going to mean is hard to say. Sometimes it has seemed like maybe the, 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 the demographic transition, which is really a big difference between our society and most of human experience, is very low fertility, extremely low fertility getting lower all the time, which is why our age structures get older and older, because there isn't anybody down there anymore. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the consequence or the cause of this low fertility, sometimes people have suggested is, oh, you didn't have grandmother there. And maybe one of the reasons that people are curtailing their fertility is they don't have those things to depend on. But we've also got lots of other things going on. The way the wor workforce works, you know, women who uh, would like to be paid the same thing men are paid for a very similar job, who are doing things that seem just as competent, we haven't quite gotten to the place where the workforce, where it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. We haven't gotten there yet. I don't even know if we really want to. <laughs> but um, sorry, again, a long answer to a to a good question. Mapping these grandmother effects in lots of different socioecologies is something a lot of people have worked on. I, I, I'm not one of them, but I do consume that literature, and, and it's really interesting to track. Okay, so unfortunately we're out of time for the uh, audio recording, but we certainly invite you to stay after and ask further questions. Um, so we have an award for you to thank you for being one of our outstanding professors. Oh, so please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, anybody who wants to, uh, you know, please leave, those of you that have to leave, but anybody who wants to stay. <laughs>